Erickson, who many of you know or know of, and he's going to present the key finding from Canada's changing uh, climate report. Um, this is a talk that Chris was to have given actually to the Ottawa Centre last March as the CMOS tour speaker, and I'm glad that we could work it in this fall in the new format. Chris is a research scientist in the Climate Research Division of Environment Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, with his research activities focusing on the use of satellite-derived data sets and climate models to identify interactions between the climate system and the cryosphere. Uh, over the past 25 years, he's participated in numerous field campaigns across the Canadian Arctic, measuring snow and sea ice to validate satellite data and models and this included a traverse that he did across the uh, Northwest Territories in Nunavut by snowmobile uh, during the IPY uh, period. It was one of the projects that was part of that effort. One thing, because I've known Chris for a long time, and one thing that I see as sort of a hallmark uh, that is developing is his teamwork, collaboration, and partnership, both within Canada and internationally. And for example, that leads to him being the science lead for a new satellite radar mission being developed with the Canadian Space Agency, uh, which is part of the European Space Agency. And there with them, uh, Chris is a co-investigator on a project on climate change indicators, particularly for snow. And on the modeling side, he is the co-chair of uh, CMIP-6 project, Land, Surface, Snow, and Soil Moisture Model Intercomparison. And in his spare time, which I can only figure out to be 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning, he's a co-editor in chief of the journal Cryosphere. Now he's built, a, he's built a very strong reputation as a scientific expert on Arctic climate change, especially related to the impacts on the cryosphere. And that's grown significantly in recent years and solidified, uh, was solidified with his role as a lead author on the IPCC special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. And most more recently, Canada's changing climate report. He's an excellent communicator and excels in communicating Arctic climate issues to a wide range of audiences. And hence he's become a, a, um, one of the main spokespersons for NECCC on communicating key messages from the Canadian report on changing climate. He's done many media interviews and he also had the opportunity to discuss Arctic climate change with the Prime Minister. So uh, we don't, my background is in the research uh, division and research scientists and uh, to be able to do all of that, to take his research and also be a great communicator is a tremendous uh, capability. So with that, I'd like to welcome Chris um, to lead us through on his uh, talk which is on the uh, uh, Canada's Changing Climate Report. So Chris, take it away. Great, thanks Barry. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Just uh, if you can't, uh, I can st still see Barry's video so he can wave frantically if I'm not coming through clearly. Thanks for the very gracious uh, introduction, Barry. As, as, as Barry mentioned, he and I uh, go back uh, multiple decades now actually and uh, Barry had a very uh, important formative role in my career at numerous stages along the way. So um, I really appreciate that Barry was the person who could introduce me uh, to the group today. So thanks a lot, Barry. So yeah, I'm really happy to give this talk uh, months later and uh, more uh, remotely than uh, we would have thought uh, some time ago, but um, it's uh, really a nice opportunity to present today the, the main findings from Canada's Changing Climate Report as well, I'm going to sprinkle in some uh, some key messages from the IPCC special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. And I think the messaging between these two assessments, one focused on Canada, one focused on the global climate system, uh, reinforce each other and help communicate um, our current uh, situation very, very well. I want to emphasize that with respect to Canada's Changing Climate Report, this really was a large collaborative effort. I'm speaking on behalf of a large team of scientists uh, from Environment and Climate Change Canada, from DFO, NRCAN, 
we had university colleagues contributing to the report as well. Um, so a big, uh, a big thank you to everybody uh, who contributed to the CCCR. So just as a brief outline today, I'll provide um, just a few slides on the role of science assessments and, and where the CCCR fits into the landscape uh, in Canada at the moment. Then I'll spend the bulk of the time going through these key messages um, uh, to sort of highlight the state with a focus on, on, uh, on northern regions uh, with, with respect to uh, climate change and its impacts. So science assessments have for quite a long time now been a critical means with which we can take the key scientific results, the knowledge of the day, and pass this information on to policymakers. Um, and so the way this process has worked uh, internationally and in Canada is in, is in different forms. Um, the key part of the term assessment is that there's no new science conducted as part of these reports. Instead, it's a critical analysis a synthesis of uh, already published material. And then it's the attachment of uh, confidence levels to conclusive statements. So, so the hope being is that we can distill down large bodies of knowledge into key points uh, and provide an underpinning that supports those key points so that we can communicate these key results up the line. Um, and a real cornerstone of these processes is that it has to be open. So um, the drafts are open for expert review. All the review comments are dealt with. That's a hallmark of the uh, um, I I IPCC process. And we followed a similar uh, protocol for the CCCR. So we have international assessments of climate change. These have come through the assessment reports of the IPCC. In this current cycle, they also commissioned three special reports. So there is a special report on impacts of 1.5 degree warming, special report on climate change and land, and a special report on oceans and cryosphere, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more um, later. The current sixth assessment report of the IPCC is under preparation now. Um, the second order drafts of those chapters are, uh, are, have been reviewed and are being uh, finalized now. So in Canada, we've never really done a full scale national assessment of climate until the CCCR, uh, which was conducted uh, in the last couple of years. This slide kind of lays out where uh, this assessment kind of fits into the landscape. So the physical basis of climate change, that's what we assessed in Canada's Changing Climate Report. That is the phase one of the larger changing climate um, uh, effort. So there's a website that has the full report on it. Um, and there's a phase two of sort of sectoral uh, national assessments that are being prepared right now. And those are listed in the center column on this slide. Um, so those chapters are, have been reviewed, but uh, the final releases of those are still forthcoming. Then we'll wrap everything up uh, later on uh, early next year with the synthesis that uh, ties everything together. And as you'll see from my slides, this kind of updating next year is important because there's always a time lag in this assessment process. So some of the trends that we report in the CCCR are maybe extended through 2016, not quite as timely as we would want. We want those right up to date. So that will all be updated as part of the synthesis exercise um, that's coming up. So the CCCR was I think overall quite a successful effort. Um, there was a lot of uptake uh, within government uh, within stakeholders, uh, through the media. Um, so I think it did a, a reasonably successful job at sort of packaging up the state of knowledge with respect to the physical basis of climate change um, and what those impacts have been across Canada. And I'll report on the key messages of those, of those uh, today. So the report is fully available online. Um, what I will go through today are basically the 10 headline statements that come from the entire um, report, so the highest level. All of these statements had a high confidence attached to them. So we did sort of transfer the IPCC calibrated uncertainty language into this Canadian assessment. Um, in addition to those 10 headline statements for the whole report, each chapter has key messages um, that outline um, the key findings in each of the thematic chapters. Those have varying levels of confidence depending on, on the, uh, on the uh, statement. So headline statement number one, this, this won't come as a surprise, uh, I don't think to people on this, on this call, 
Um, Canada's climate has warmed. Uh, it will continue to warm further in the future and human influence is the primary driver of this warming. Greenhouse gas emissions uh, are driving this warming. And because of the long residence time of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, this warming is effectively locked in. So we're committed to any uh, warming that we've experienced to this date because of the uh, fact that these greenhouse gases will reside, carbon dioxide will reside in the atmosphere for hundreds of more years. This message, while fairly simple, is one that resonated uh, with the public, I think quite a bit, especially through our uh, media um, contacts. I think some people have the perception that if you turn the carbon switch off, then somehow temperatures will cool, um, which is you know, simply not the case. There are these very long multi-century time lags built into the system. So this was a very straightforward message, um, but one that we wanted to lead off the headline statements uh, from the report. So what does this human influence on the global climate system looks like? Well, we sort of have this idea now of sort of carbon budgets, and that's what we're trying to outline on the slide on the left. I think you can see my cursor if I, if I move it slowly enough, but on that x-axis of this plot, we're showing the cumulative total carbon dioxide emissions starting in 1870. The global temperature anomaly is shown on the y-axis. So as you release cumulatively more carbon from human activity, you increase the corresponding uh, warming. Um, so this is where we can sort of see the pathway we've been on historically, and the lines in the shading out into the future indicate different carbon intensive futures, um, and shows how we can expect as time marches on and our CO2 emissions continue to build the corresponding temperature anomaly to it. So it's Plots like this that were a focal point of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees of warming because it really wanted to focus on where are we now? How much time do we have until 1.5 degrees of warming? How much more time do we have until two degrees of global warming? And then what are the comparative impact differences between one and a half versus two years? So I won't go into details on that assessment report, um, but that was the focus of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees of warming. The plot on the right are examples from the uh, Canadian Earth System model where they did some experiments where they zeroed carbon dioxide emissions at different points in time. So the green line shows what would have happened if CO2 emissions were zeroed in 2010, and then the red line is 2100. It shows the corresponding increase in global mean temperature change what, depending on when we can get to a net zero um, uh, emission uh, timing. So. The important point here is, of course, as I mentioned on the previous slide, any warming we've experienced to date, even when you turn that carbon switch off, it does persist into the future. So we are committed uh, globally to the amount of warming. Um, so this persists even after our CO2 um, uh, emissions reach a net, net zero. You can also see the impact of time. So every decade that passes, uh, where there's uh, no effort made to, to mitigate our carbon emissions uh, results in significant warming. So the, 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 the movement up that y-axis of the black line between 2010 and 2100 is quite dramatic, moving from about four degrees global mean temperature up to six and a half. Um, so this kind of gives people a sense of the timelines and the intensities um, that we're dealing with. The Paris Agreement goal um, is to limit global warming to below two degrees Celsius, hopefully 1.5 degrees. Uh, where do we sit on this pathway? Um, so this shows historical temperatures, uh, so the warming we've experienced since about the mid 20th century. This plot was for, produced in 2017, so it shows kind of where we were at that point. Uh, we're continuing along this current rate, and it shows you that we have, you know, until around 2040 to 2050, to get to a point where we're able to uh, plateau those temperature increases. So this gives us a sense of the sort of the, the, the timing we have, the urgency that, um, that carbon budgets uh, need to be dealt with globally um, to meet the Paris Agreement targets. One thing I wanted to just mention briefly on this slide was impacts of COVID-19. So obviously when you have large scale shutdown of businesses, uh, of travel, uh, around the world. Um, well, there's a lot of thinking of, well, what does this mean for carbon budgets? And this is a very active area of uh, research from a lot of different uh, modeling centers. I'm just uh, taking some results from a paper published recently in Nature Climate Change. 
they emphasize here that the climate effects of COVID-19 are very minimal, um, that the real changes we'll see in the future uh, depend on how we recover um, uh, from this crisis. So, so for, I'll try to walk through some of these, these plots quickly, but what they uh, observed is uh, the blue line on this top time series is the global NOx emissions. These have declined by about 30% in April, uh, primarily because of uh, declines in uh, surface transport. This would have and does have a uh, short-term cooling influence on the global climate system. It's offset by this 20% reduction in global sulfur dioxide emissions. This is from changes in industrial um, actions during um, the peak of the COVID shutdown. This has impacts on the aerosol cooling effect, which means it has a short-term warming influence. So that's where this net impact of uh, the COVID-19 shutdown on our rates of warming, on sort of our carbon budget um, is quite minimal. Um, so what really becomes interesting are these green lines on the bottom plots, which are as governments restart businesses, as economies come back to life, what different decisions are made, what different future pathways do we go down? And we'll get back to this um, concept of these different future pathways uh, on some future slides. But just an interesting um, piece of work here, and there will be a lot more coming out shortly on um, just what did happen to the global climate system as a result of this very short term um, change to, uh, to um, emissions. So we know that keeping warming below our two degrees Celsius target uh, requires uh, global emissions uh, to decrease. In this slide, and this slide really just provides some background information for a lot of the future scenarios that, so that I'll show in future slides uh, and subsequent slides. So the red line um, corresponds to RCP 8.5 or a, uh, a high emissions uh, future. So we contrast that with um, RCP 2.6, which is the, the blue line here, which is a very ambitious policy, which would have the result of limiting mean global warming to about 1.6 degrees. There are RCPs that future um, pathways that are kind of in the middle, that's shown by the gray line and the yellow line. Um, I won't focus uh, too much on those. A lot of the results from the IPCC use the high emissions and the low emissions to sort of bracket the two future or two future uh, uh, pathways. Um, and you can just know that these other uh, mid mid range uh, projections are always kind of in the middle of those upper and upper and lower bounds. So really to get on this 1.5 degrees Celsius emission pathway, globally, the, it's around 2050 when we need to reach uh, a net zero uh, carbon dioxide budget. So quite ambitious changes are needed. So now looking at Canada as a whole, how, is, uh, how has uh, Canada warmed? These are results from the CCCR. So the, the annual average temperature across Canada has increased by about 1.7 degrees um, since our best uh, period of uh, instrumental record starts in 1948. This is about twice the global rate. So this plot on the right is one that we showed quite a bit, got um, quite a bit of uh, uh, attention in the release of the CCCR. So the red is the global temperature increase, blue is Canada, and then the gray line above that is the Canadian Arctic. So we know that warming is not uniform across Canada. There's regional differences. Some of these are due to natural um, uh, changes we see in the climate system. Others are due to feedbacks that we understand uh, much more clearly. So in general, the warming is greater in Northern Canada compared to Southern Canada. This is consistent with other Northern countries. Um, around the hemisphere, and this is due to well-known feedbacks involving the atmosphere, involving snow, involving sea ice. Um, so we also know from climate model experiments that most of the observed increase in annual average temperature is attributed to human uh, influence. So it's greenhouse gas emissions driving global warming, which is driving warming, of course, across Canada and seeing the amplified warming because we're a northern country. What future warming looks like in Canada does depend directly on global emissions. So now if looking at Canada specifically, the line plot on the left shows historically where we've been with respect to temperature change over time. These are um, 
yeah, temperature changes over time, and then the low emissions pathway in blue and the high emissions pathway in red. And you can see it's a, a significant uh, difference where under the low emissions scenario, we're looking at about two degrees projected warming um, by mid-century, and the temperatures plateau or remain fairly steady after that. Under the high emission scenario, temperature increases continue. They reach about six degrees Celsius by end of century. And of course, 2100 is an arbitrary cutoff on this time series. If there's no change in carbon emissions, that line would continue uh, to increase under, the, under that high emissions um, scenario. So what does this mean for temperatures across Canada? Just showing an example of the winter season from RCP 8.5. This is end of century um, temperature change over Canada. So this is the high carbon emissions future. We're seeing enhanced warming over northern Canada. That's consistent with what we've observed historically to this point. It's consistent with what all climate models project into the future. And we're seeing here, um, you know, in southern Canada, warming of five degrees reaching up to 10 degrees or more in Arctic Canada. So this winter season warming um, would obviously have profound impacts on ecosystems, economies, um, people all across the country, but especially uh, in northern Canada. So the one of the key messages we wanted to make, uh, and I'll address these in subsequent slides, is that the effects of widespread warming are already evident across nearly all of Canada, and we expect these to intensify in the future. So these impacts across Canada include changes to extreme heat events and cold events, impacts on snow cover, glaciers, our oceans, precipitation, stream flow, permafrost, sea level, wildfire. I could go on and on. There's many more things that, uh, com you know, components of our uh, Earth system that are being impacted by uh, climate change. We know that further warming is unavoidable, at least on the decade to decade time scales. So the observed trends, the observed impacts, the risks that we see resulting from climate change will continue. So this is, again, quite simple and straightforward messaging. Um, and I'll get into some of these um, specific impact areas um, in a bit more detail. So with respect to uh, extremes, um, what these maps of Canada show is that our uh, nighttime temperatures, our lowest daily minimums typically are increasing faster than the highest daily maximum. So we've got more red triangles and they're larger on the lowest daily minimum map here on the right. Um, and attribution studies have again, just like with mean temperature, have attributed these changes in extreme temperatures um, to human influence on the climate system. Other effects of this widespread warming, we have an increase in the growing season. So that's shown in the map on the right. So across all of Canada, we have an increase in the growing season. This does indicate perhaps some, uh, in some ways, positive impacts of climate change. But we have to be very careful that having a longer growing season doesn't necessarily help you if you have a moisture deficit, for instance. So there's, there's all, many facets to looking at results of this nature. We're seeing changes in the annual stream flow cycles. So with more rainfall events in the winter, uh, with warmer temperatures in the winter, we're seeing higher winter base flow. Uh, we tend to see an earlier and slightly reduced um, spring snowmelt peak runoff. And then the result of this shift to higher winter and earlier spring flow is that we have reduced flow in the summer. So this change in seasonality to stream flow has impacts on freshwater availability uh, and freshwater for human use, for ecosystem use uh, across the country. Uh, with respect to snow cover and sea ice, um, what we're showing here are trends from 1981 to 2015, so a fairly uh, short time series compared to the surface observations, but this is a blended data set that uses satellite remote sensing and a variety of a mix of surface observations with land surface models to give us um, robust trends across Canada. For sea ice, we're using the Canadian Ice Service Digital Archive. Those go back to 1968, so we have a longer period covered for the sea ice trends. But we're seeing you know, very consistent declines in snow cover and sea ice uh, across Canada in the fall. Um, big declines in sea ice across eastern Canada in the winter. You can see that in the winter map in the, uh, in the top left. And of course, uh, dramatic summer uh, sea ice losses 
So we're showing that in the, the summer map here on the bottom left. Um, so we're losing sea ice. We're also losing the, the, the nature of sea ice or the nature of sea ice is changing. So we're, our multi-year sea ice trends are significantly negative. So this perennial sea ice that can survive a melt season is being replaced by thinner, more mobile uh, seasonal sea ice. Just to update our Northern Hemisphere snow trends a little bit, this is recent work from, that was led by my colleague, Lawrence Mudrick. Here we're showing snow cover extent, that's the top plot, and snow cover, or snow mass, uh, that's the bottom plot. Anomalies over the whole hemisphere, so this is not just Canada, this is the hemisphere. The monthly trends are shown in the uh, columns or the bars on the left, and then the colors indicate whether the anomalies in any given month in a given year are negative or positive. So what you can see is the snow extent and the snow mass trends are negative over the hemisphere in all months of the year. Of course, we don't see much happening in the summer because there's very little snow over the land surface. Um, and anomalies in recent years are um, strongly uh, negative, both for snow extent and snow mass. So further evidence that the changes that we're seeing across Canada are consistent with the hemispheric scale changes, that we're losing snow cover. It's falling later in the fall. It's melting earlier in the spring. And the amount of snow that's accumulating the snow mass uh, is becoming less. The more dramatic uh, changes we've seen are, have are uh, on the thickness change of uh, some of these long-term glacier sites across Canada. So these are really valuable surface uh, observations that have been made continuously uh, since the late 1950s. Uh, I guess one of the impacts of COVID will be that we may have a break uh, in the record because um, our glaciological service colleagues were unable, as I understand, to get out this summer to make the measurements. But um, this is a really valuable record to show is the thinning of glaciers, both in the high Arctic and in Western Canada. Uh, the impacts of this thinning are, are different in the two regions. Uh, in the high Arctic, uh, it is an important contribution to sea level rise. Uh, in Western Canada, the, eventual loss of all this land ice represents a significant loss of fresh, fresh water supply to Canadians. So, you know, we're really seeing unprecedented rates of mass loss in the Arctic, and we're seeing, um, you know, certainly by the end of this century, uh, significant loss of glaciers in Western Canada that are used for water supply. So that's, uh, that's a major event. And of course, parallel to this, I don't have a slide on this, but um, Derek Mueller, who's on the call, could certainly say some words about the Milne, uh, the loss of the Milne ice shelf. Um, so we're seeing ice shelf impacts as well. So a lot of dramatic recent events uh, happening in the, uh, in the Canadian high Arctic. With respect to permafrost, uh, we know it's warming. Um, so this is uh, important in its own right. This plot on the bottom left is borehole temperatures from across the hemisphere. And these show for both cold permafrost and relatively warm permafrost, uh, it is increasing. As part of the IPCC SROC, we did do this assessment that's shown in the columns on the right of whether uh, permafrost is a sink or a source of carbon. This is a really important open-ended question with respect to the potential contribution of carbon currently stored in permafrost um, to the carbon cycle. So you can see that using different modeling approaches, different synthesis approaches, there's still a lot of um, of, of open-ended questions about whether over time we are viewing permafrost areas as a carbon source or sink. We can expect uh, a lot more um, research in this area. And I've highlighted on this slide just a couple of recent papers, one of which is looking at abrupt thaw. So this is this, these abrupt changes to the landscape. Uh, Merit Turetsky led this, uh, led this paper. Abrupt thaw processes are not at all considered in the current generation of Earth system models. So this is one source of potential carbon to the atmosphere that is not considered, uh, but could be significant uh, over the coming um, decades. There's another paper from a large number of colleagues that looked at um, the winter season behavior of permafrost. And the conclusion of this paper was that there's actually, there's more carbon flux occurring during the winter. The permafrost isn't quite as quiet as we thought it was when it's covered by snow. Snow effectively insulates um, the soil. So there's a lot more happening during the winter than we once thought. So all this to say that permafrost carbon budget questions are very important. There's a lot of uncertainty um, and we can expect a lot of effort to be put forward in this area um, in coming years, both on the observational side and the modeling side. 
And within Canada, um, there's the Permafrost Network. It's a re recently funded uh, NSERC network that um, Stefan Gruber at Carleton is the PI for. So I think Canada is well positioned uh, to make some important um, steps forward in this area under the permafrost net uh, framework. Climate models continue to project changes to snow and ice and permafrost across Canada. Um, these maps show the projected decreases in snow cover extent and uh, sea ice concentration across Canada. All you see is brown on these maps. So suffice it to say that is decreases in ice concentration, decreases in snow cover extent in all seasons. Um, an important aspect on the sea ice story for Canada is that um, the region where we do expect in the summer to see the last uh, resident sea ice in the Arctic is kind of along the north coast of Ellesmere Island here, the Canadian Arctic Ar Archipelago, and along the north coast of Greenland. So even when the Arctic is relatively ice free in the summer, we will still see some sea ice drifting through Canadian marine territories. So this is important because it represents a navigation hazard. Uh, it's an important remnant ecosystem. Um, so Canada's role in kind of protecting this last uh, area of summer sea ice uh, is really unique. One thing that we've been able to show recently is that at the hemispheric scale, uh, snow cover, sea ice, permafrost extent, all of these components of the cryosphere that respond quite quickly to temperature forcing actually show this really nice relationship with mean global temperature changes. So what this plot is showing is a recent paper that uh, again, Lawrence Mudrick was the lead author on, colleague of mine. We're showing the global air temperature change along the x-axis and the Northern hemisphere snow cover extent response along the y-axis. The colors indicate different future projections of climate change from a low carbon future. That's SSP 126 here for CMIP6. A high carbon future is in the red color. And you can see that it really falls along a one-to-one -one line. So as you increase warming, you lose snow. It's very simple. Um, it's the same for sea ice. It's the same for permafrost extent. These fast response components of the cryosphere respond very quickly to temperature forcing. So what this means is whatever future emissions pathway we choose globally will control the response of snow and sea ice and permafrost uh, to our changing climate. So just a bit more from the SROC. So uh, I was working on the polar regions chapter of this report. The high level key messages from the SROC were that the world's ocean and cryosphere have essentially been taking the heat from climate change for decades. And the role of the ocean that's in taking a lot of heat from the atmosphere and storing it in the upper ocean. For the cryosphere, it means melt. Um, the consequences of changes, even though the ocean and the cryosphere are remote places where not a lot of people live, the consequences are severe uh, from changes going on in these areas. And clearly, as the previous slide showed, the more decisively and earlier we act, the more we're able to avoid the more intense changes to these regions that therefore uh, would increase the risk to us. So I'll have a bit more detail on SROC um, later, but these were kind of the key talking points um, that that were generated from the report. So in the SROC, we, we showed, we produced a lot of plots like this. These are reinforcing the results of the Canada's Changing Climate Report, but at a slightly larger scale. We're showing historical in purple, uh, time series of snow cover extent for the Arctic, permafrost area, sea ice extent, and then the different future climate projections based on a high emission scenario in red and a low emission scenario in blue. The take home point here is that we can stabilize losses in snow cover, we can stabilize loss of permafrost and sea ice if we have uh, a low carbon emissions future. So in all cases, we will continue to lose snow, sea ice and permafrost, but they will stabilize by 2050, the same time when temperatures um, would stabilize as well, because they respond to that short term temperature forcing. If we don't stabilize temperatures, we don't stabilize the response of the cryosphere. So it's a very, it's a very simple, um, very simple response. What this means, for, again, for the Canadian Arctic, I mentioned this earlier, but the, there's this last ice area that's shaded in white here. We will um, see the remnant sea ice in the summer uh, residing in this area. But what climate model simulations show is that for a number of months each year, for a number of different regions of the Canadian Arctic, we can expect there to be sea ice free conditions. 
So for Hudson Bay, that means we basically have a 100% chance of there being no sea ice between August and November, which if you're a polar bear living in Churchill, that's not very good for your hunting. Uh, other parts of the region, even the Beaufort Sea, we have a 60 to 70% chance by 2050 that there'll be no sea ice in the Beaufort Sea in September, perhaps extending into, um, into October as well. So um, really profound impacts on northern communities, on access to the Arctic, so things like shipping. Um, so these um, sea ice free months uh, really become an important thing to consider as we think about um, what the future Canadian Arctic might look like. Uh, the oceans surrounding Canada have warmed. They've become more acidic. There's lower oxygen levels. So our colleagues at DFO produced a really nice chapter in the CCCR on uh, changes in our three oceans. So um, we expect the ocean warming, the loss of oxygen to intensify because it's responding to the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Acidification of the ocean is increasing, will continue to increase. Um, that acidification has a real impact on the health of marine ecosystems. Um, any critter that has an exoskeleton or a shell, uh, small changes in pH of the ocean water can have quite an impact uh, for them. So uh, these changes to the ocean, um, the physical environment of the ocean uh, are very, very important. Second important aspect from the oceans is sea level rise. Um, so we know global mean sea level rise is increasing, it's accelerating in recent decades, and it's, that's being fed by two major processes. So the first is the cryosphere contribution. So this is melt from ice sheets. So we have the Greenland ice sheet contribution, the Antarctic ice sheet contribution, and then the northern, the Arctic uh, glacier mass loss contribution. So it's hard to see the historical lines on these plots, but I think what's really striking is the, the future losses. So even under um, a low carbon emission future, we can expect you know, 30 centimeters uh, or more of increase in sea level rise to come from um, mass loss. The other important part of the equation is the ocean heat content. So the upper ocean is absorbing a lot of heat from the atmosphere that results in thermal expansion. So collectively, this ocean heat content and the cryosphere component are driving this global sea level rise. So these are pretty striking. If you look at the red lines out to 2100, um, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, pretty dramatic increases, uh, you know, up to a meter uh, of sea level rise. What becomes really concerning is if you run the climate models out to 2300. So that's what I'm showing on the, the bottom. This is one of the plots from the summary for policymakers from the SROC. And here you're looking at um, for a high carbon emissions future, uh, sea level rise of three to four meters. Uh, which has obviously profound uh, impacts on coastal regions, on low-lying island states. Um, so that's a really important uh, and significant impact. Now, IPCC has attached what we call deep uncertainty to these future projections. That means we can produce these from climate models, um, but we have much less confidence or much higher uncertainty in what these long horizon sea level rise increases might look like. That's due to a number of factors, um, some of which involve the parameterization of ice sheet processes and climate models. Um, fewer climate modeling groups have run these experiments out that long, so we have a smaller subset of models to work with. Um, and there's really great uncertainty into what the carbon forcing scenario looks like out to 2300. So for all those reasons, we attach deep uncertainty, but despite that uncertainty, uh, you know, the fact that we could have more than four meters, uh, the upper limit is five meters of sea level rise by 2300, obviously has you know, grave consequences. So coastal areas of Canada, this is going now back to the CCCR. Um, we're expecting to see an increase in flooding events. Um, one thing that is unique to the Canadian Arctic is that the loss of sea ice in the Beaufort Sea, for instance, um, further increases the risk of damage uh, to, uh, in coastal regions because sea ice provides a nice buttressing protective effect um, that's lost, you know, especially during these longer seasons of, uh, of ice-free ice, ice conditions. These are the um, sea level rise uh, changes across Canada. You can see uh, we're projecting increases in sea level rise at, at, at end of century that reach 75 centimeters or more in Eastern Canada and parts of Western Canada. 
We are seeing uh, sea level fall in the Arctic uh, outside of the Beaufort Sea region. That's still a result of the um, response of the Earth's crust to the last ice age. For precipitation, I'll move through some of these last uh, slides quickly. Um, we know that a warming climate, a warmer atmosphere, supports more precipitation. So we see in the historical record a trend towards increased precipitation across Canada. That's what the time series plot is showing and the map shows that this increased precipitation is focused uh, largely on northern Canada. Uh, we have overall less confidence in the observed changes in precipitation and temperature due to the observing network characteristics, but we, this is consistent with what you know, climate models suggest um, that we should be seeing. For precipitation projections, in general, the climate models project a wetter Canada in the future. I'm showing a map here for winter precipitation change under a high carbon emission future. Um, this is increased snowfall over the Arctic because temperatures would be sufficiently cold that this precipitation still falls as snow uh, over northern Canada. We are seeing a change in the proportion of rainfall versus snowfall. So obviously as temperatures warm, we're seeing increased rainfall um, and decreased uh, snowfall during the uh, fall, winter and spring. Uh, precipitation projections get a little bit more nuanced as we move into the summer, where southern Canada under RCP 8.5 uh, is showing uh, decreased precipitation. So this goes back to that earlier plot I showed with growing season. So it's great that we have a longer growing season over central Canada, but if we have decreased summer precipitation combined with decreased freshwater availability because we've lost our western Canadian glaciers that provide a lot of water to the prairies, that could put um, severe water availability constraints uh, in that region. So that's something that we need to be aware of. We're getting this change seasonality of freshwater um, availability. I kind of hinted at, or alluded to this earlier. So we have shallower snow, warmer winters, earlier snow melt, um, changes the timing of the peak flow. We'll lose that freshwater pulse that comes from glacier melt during the summer as we lose the glacier mass itself. Um, and then superimposed on that is if you have a warmer summer, you also increase evapotranspiration. So all of this suggests that there is increased risk factors uh, for water availability over Canada moving forward. Extreme events are something that a lot of people uh, care about. So this is high temperature, uh, high precipitation, extreme events. Um, and so we, there was some return analysis, return period um, analysis that's in the CCCR that shows that what used to be a one in 20 year hot extreme will now become a one in two year extreme event. And what used to be a one in 20 year rainfall extreme will now become a one in 10 year extreme. So these are sensitive to the different climate projections in the future. I won't go into the details of these plots, but suffice it to say that extreme events become more frequent. And the impact of these extremes um, are significant. So these extreme precipitation events, these short duration summer precipitation events, these are the sorts of things that flood your basement. So the impact on people is quite profound. Uh, the fire risk is there as well. Um, so as you increase hot temperatures, you, you lose your snowpack earlier, decrease your soil moisture, all this contributes uh, to increased wildfire risk. So getting down to my, my final slides here, the point that we really wanted to emphasize to Canadians through the CCCR is that the rate and magnitude of climate change is very different for Canada under a high carbon emission future and a low carbon emission future. So the maps here show temperature change annually averaged at end of century for a low carbon emissions future on the left and a high carbon emissions future on the right. I showed this one, this map on the right a little bit earlier. So this is where we see up to 10 degrees or more warming in the Canadian Arctic. Um, under the low carbon emissions future, still significant changes, but we limit warming to two degrees over Southern Canada and three to four degrees over Arctic Canada. So this just shows us that, um, you know, the, the future is not yet established. The, the pathway we're on is not yet set. Um, and whichever future pathway we choose will have a dramatic impact on what temperatures and therefore associated impacts uh, will look like uh, across Canada. Um, this is sort of the final slide that we've been trying to leave people across the country with. Um, and I think we've got 
really um, a positive response from people in all the outreach we did um, through the media, through other public events, this sense that climate change is real, that the climate change science is compelling, it's strong, there's clear evidence of this warming across Canada. We understand why this warming is happening, we understand what the impacts are, we have to plan to mitigate and adapt to that. We understand that additional warming and further changes in our climate system can't be avoided. Um, so these are really important messages that I think are starting to resonate with Canadians, uh, with multiple levels of government uh, as well. And our hope is that scientific assessments, like the IPCC special reports and the annual, or, or the um, uh, assessment reports, and then a, a domestic effort like Canada's Changing Climate Report, you know, will continue to highlight for people the urgency of, of, uh, of dealing with these challenges. So I'll leave this slide on uh, just to say a big thank you to all of the contributing authors to the CCCR. As I mentioned today, uh, I am speaking for a large number of people that uh, assessed a large body of science. Um, so thanks to all the scientists who do the work. You can't have an assessment if you don't have literature to assess. So uh, you know it's really important that the science community continues to push everything forward. And I think these assessments are very useful in providing clear messaging. Um, to governments and to the public. So I'll stop there, Barry. And um, if you want to triage any questions in the chat, that'd be great. Thanks for your attention. OK, thanks very much, uh, Chris. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, uh, on the chat. I invite others to add to it, please. Um, but I'm going I'm to throw out a general one first, um, if I may, from myself. Uh, you mentioned at the end about the people are um, responding well to the message. Um, in, in those discussions, I mean, a lot of the timeline, 2100, let alone 2300, is a long way out. And often decision makers, even the public, are more worried about the here and now and not the longer term. Do you get feedback from people on how they're thinking about that in your discussions? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And what we've sort of tried to frame it is, is in people's perception of risk. And it's kind of human nature where even if there's a, something is guaranteed to happen, like climate change is happening, these future changes will happen. But we're able, the human condition is such that we can say, well, that's decades down the road. I don't have to worry about it. But it's coming. It's a very slow moving train, but it's coming. And so, um, People need to adapt their thinking with respect to the risk assessment. And I think now the evidence, both scientific evidence and anecdotal evidence, people are seeing the impacts more directly. So they're more willing to accept that it's something that needs to be dealt with on their time scale and their children's time scale, as opposed to something that can be pushed completely off into the future. But I think actually the public response to COVID-19 has been a really interesting thing where it's COVID is a risk that impacts everybody right now. Like today, you have to change what you're doing. And people were told that and as of tomorrow, you can't go to your office. You can't do this. You can't do that. And everybody went, okay, I will follow that guidance because this is a risk to me right now. With climate change, it's a little bit different because what we're telling people is this is a risk that will happen, but it's going to be more intense later than it is now. So that means people respond to it in a very different way. So that is that is an ongoing challenge. Okay, thanks, Chris. Now, uh, I've got a couple of questions on chat. And what I'm going to do at the moment is uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Chris, if you don't mind, and just keep adding. Um, from Miriam Yousefi, who, by the way, was a, one of our student reps at University of Ottawa until she uh, moved on this year very recently. And um, she was wondering if the regional response, such as Northern Hemisphere permafrost cover, is highly correlated with the global climate change, i.e. global surface air temperature. Yes, it, that's a good question. And it, yeah, that, is, that is exactly right. So what we're showing in this plot, for instance, second so this is um, snow cover, not permafrost, but there actually was a recent paper out that showed very similar, very similar result. Um, so this is the, the change in snow cover with the 
global air temperature change along the bottom axis. So this is not regional, this is global. So you can scale up essentially a northern change, in this case snow cover, to a global temperature response. If we did, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of room for more detailed regional analysis that could show what the direct forcing relationship is to regional temperature anomalies with permafrost, snow, and sea ice in those regions. But what's interesting is that you can scale it up um, to, this, to this higher level. Okay, and there was a second part to her question. How much would be the influence of national effort on controlling the greenhouse gas emissions in national climate change? That yeah. gets to your regional comment. Yeah, so I mean, this is another thing that is, it's, it's important that um, it will take a coordinated global effort to, to impact emissions to the level needed to have a strong and direct impact on temperature. So it is an international problem. Um, and so it requires an international solution. And so I think what people hope is that governments can come together to deal with this challenge, much like they have done successfully in the past for other major challenges, whether it was acid rain or ozone. There are previous examples of international cooperation to solve major environmental challenges. Climate change is in that same category. Of course, it's much more complicated because of the uh, economic impacts, the lifestyle impacts. So um, th there, there does need to be more than just a national response. Um, it needs an international uh, response, but I think it's incumbent on us to be proactive in our own country to try to work with other like-minded countries to lead the way. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, now from, uh, by the way, there's several on the chat giving you congratulations, so, uh, <laughs> which is uh, very nice. But there's one from uh, Walla. I wonder if the report mentions the definition of extreme weather events in Canada. Yes, so I would have to go back and look at the extremes chapter, uh, which my colleague Jubin Zhang at Environment Canada was the lead author on. And knowing Jubin as I do, I'm sure he he's following the. Um, I'm sure there's a definition of their they they treat extreme events with a very quantitative uh, framework. Um, so I'd have to go back and look at the extreme events uh, chapter, um, but it is it is there in the CCCR. Sorry, that's probably an unsatisfying answer. Can't know. <laughs> um, and one from uh, Denny Burke. Thank you so much. Where'd it go? There. When are the subsequent reports, and it was your first or second slide, due? Who is completing them? Yeah. Okay. So this is a very good question. And I probably uh, wish, I wish my colleague Elizabeth Bush was with me on the call today. So Elizabeth and I, when we started doing these CMOS talks, we did them together. And Elizabeth was the lead for the CCCR effort. And she always knows the landscape of all the reports very well, uh, much better than I do. So unfortunately, now that we're doing it remotely, Elizabeth's not on the call today. So I'll try and answer it clearly. But um, I, I have seen drafts of the, um, so there's the regional perspectives, like there's a Northern Canada chapter, there's, there's different, chapters of the regional analysis. Um, there are, the national issues includes different sectors like freshwater. Um, I've seen some of these chapters. They're in the preparation stages now. Uh, Nat Natural Resources Canada has responsibility for this column of reports. And my understanding is that they will be out in 2021. Whether there's been any COVID related slippage on that timeline, uh, I don't know. Um, but I think we can expect these out in the first half of 2021. That's my understanding. And there will be a collection uh, of these phase two um, reports. Then what we need to do is go back and what we want to do is release this enhanced synthesis kind of along the same time as the IPCC AR6 uh, is released. Now that timeline has been pushed back a little bit because of COVID. Um, but what we want to do is provide Canadians with updated synthesis trends information on climate change that takes that very kind of high level international perspective of the AR6 and distills it down uh, to a level that um, Canadian policymakers 
stakeholders um, can use. That will be, we're just now starting our discussions on how exactly we want to approach this, but that won't be, I think, until the latter part then of 2021. So hopefully I haven't misspoken and hopefully we'll see um, these reports out um, in the next year. Okay, and I have another one which I'll read out carefully. It's a bit longer from uh, Lydia Kosar. I read about a recent change in the rate of melt of the Greenland ice sheet that indicated sustained glacier retreat, even if temperature stabilized, uh, if she understands the article correctly. Will this have an impact on the relatively rapid response of the cryosphere to reduce temperature rise? And does this complicate how we look at emissions management beyond just reducing emissions? And thank you for the great presentation. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, and thanks for the thanks for the question. So, I'm not an ice sheet person, although I learned a lot about ice sheets through the IPCC <laughs> process. So, so uh, I'll try to I'll try to answer this. I know um, through this, the uh, the science Twitter community that that I follow, there was a lot of discussion about that paper. Um, it was a great paper, and it, it but there is some uncertainties about the um, parameterizations used in the model that they used to simulate that, and about the. My understanding is that a lot of that was based on the mass loss through calving glaciers and other processes um, that were projected to continue into the future. There's some discussion of whether that would or would not happen. Um, so all that to say the mass loss contributions from Greenland to uh, sea level rise are profound and important. Um, there's more work needed to model them better. Um, and I think what that paper highlighted was this um, kind of distinction of fast response components of the cryosphere and slow response components of the cryosphere. Um, so ice sheets being kind of a slow response component um, is uh, maybe not as clear as we once thought and that shutting down some of these uh, our emissions may not have the immediate impact on some things as we thought. And again, it's because this warming is locked into the atmosphere. So that that's, I'm not sure. I, I do know the paper you're uh, referring to, but I don't quite have the expertise to get into it too much more than that. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Now I have, uh, we're at the end of the list. I have one comment from Lucy Campbell, which I will come back to. Um, but I have one last question and you know what? I probably would have to ask it. <laughs> well, it relates to observations. And I mean, you've got the satellite mission and I'd love to hope that that's gonna be successful and the uh, work that goes around to uh, doing that and the uh, need for it, not only for Canada, but for on a global scale. But the whole in situ um, surface-based um, remote sensors, be it drones, be it uh, uh, satellites. Often we hear what the models are doing and there's not always a rigorous assessment of what the observations are saying or often they're dismissed as noise. And I'd like your opinion on observations in the broadest context and modeling yeah. in moving forward. I'll preface my answer by saying I'm pretty sure Barry asked me that question at my PhD defense because he was <laughs> he was on my committee. <laughs> but I think uh, I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, um, well, I mean, surface networks remain uh, vitally important. So, um, you know, we for these snow cover trends that I'm showing um, on this plot here, it's true that we we rely on remote sensing and land surface models to produce the spatial information across all of Canada because the surface networks just don't give us the coverage we need, especially over the subarctic and Arctic. But some of those component data sets, like the remote sensing, the passive microwave remote sensing data set we use, rely on surface observations as part of the algorithm, as part of the assimilation framework. Modern reanalysis products like ERA-5, they assimilate surface observations. So you can't do a good job on reanalysis. You can't do a good job on remote sensing. You can't do a good job on modeling if you don't have the observations. So, you know, in our view, I think to really understand all these things, it's that three-legged stool. You have observations, you have modeling, you have remote sensing. And if you pull away one of those legs, then your stool tips over and nothing works quite as well. 
So, you know, there are challenges to maintaining the observing network. Um, we are working on a paper right now that Barry will find very interesting that looks on the impacts of the move from ruler measurements of snow depth to automated measurements of snow depth in the MSC network. And that's a technical small issue, but it turns out actually it's kind of meaningful. So, you know, we're trying to do our homework to maintain a profile of the surface networks um, and to sort of make sure senior management at Environment Canada understands that we need investment in all three of these areas. You have to maintain the networks, you have to do remote sensing, and we have to do modeling. We have to do all three. Good, thank you. Um, I'll, again, I'll, uh, one question came in from John Stone. Lucy, I will get back to your comment because it's in, uh, relevant in a different way. Uh, is there evidence that climate change is accelerating? Previous IPCC reports avoided concluding this. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a word that we do tend to avoid using. I'm trying to maybe find the right slide. I know I got my knuckles wrapped when I was a grad student by my now Environment Canada colleague, Greg Flato, for loosely using the term accelerate when talking about a change in a trend because you know a, a linear trend is not an accelerated trend. So I would say uh, over Canada, at least, we, we have avoided using that term and uh, we, haven't, um, we haven't seen it. In some other variables, if you look at the projections, the climate models certainly suggest that we could see trends which uh, accelerate over time. You, you know, again, some of these uh, mass balance trends in the Arctic, you could probably convince yourself they've accelerated. Not so much in Western Canada, but um, so, you know, it is a, a term that needs to be backed up by the math, um, but uh, it, it does apply in some cases, but I don't think it applies yet to surface temperature. Okay, great. Well, I, I mentioned uh, a comment from Lucy Campbell and I'm, I'm coming back to it. Uh, don't run away, Chris. Um, she starts off by saying, interesting presentation. As I mentioned, there are others who have said that. Um, also, thanks for organizing these talks. Um, where'd it go? <laughs> for the, organizing these talks remotely. I haven't been able to attend, I believe uh, Lucy's at uh, Carleton, for many years since I'm usually teaching at this time. And I want to make the comment that if we can engage our universities better, um, we're really pleased about that. So any feedback from uh, university, uh, be it students, faculty that have been on the talk that'll help us do it better or uh, approach it differently, we'd really appreciate. Um, now, if I, I'm gonna slip in one last question that just came in and then uh, stop it there. And, but I, if there are further questions and we're, uh, I'm sure we can get them to Chris and he could respond as appropriate. Um, this is from Ling, uh, Lin Tao Li. Uh, again, thanks for your great presentation. Global warming has a lot of negative effect, especially for low latitude countries. Uh, since Canada is located at high latitudes and global warming brings more annual precip and warmer winter, can global war warming overall be good for Canada? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a fair question, and uh, you know it. It uh, when you see, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback from some communities on this this plot here that um, you know what's the impact of a longer growing season, um, and so you know, so number one, Canada is a big country, so the regional impacts from region to region, from season to season, they're going to be different. Um, so we don't want to, we can't paint with too broad of a brush. Um, and so while we know the impacts could be very negative for certain variables in certain places, um, that may not be the case um, everywhere all the time. Um, I think the general, the general mindset needs to be what the collective impacts are. So, you know, we, it's easy to show maps like this that show uh, a change in the growing season. So long, longer growing season, that's great. But again, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't match that growing season with the right freshwater availability, then um, a longer growing season doesn't necessarily, doesn't really help you. So um, I think issues need to be looked at from a comprehensive frame, but it's a fair question in the sense that the impacts will not be the same across 
all of Canada for everybody uh, all the time. So I'll, I'll probably leave that there, Barry. And if people have other questions, I know we're kind of out of time, but um, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to, to answer questions by email. Oh, good. And any uh, pe if people have comments, questions to the Ottawa uh, Centre, you can get our contact from the uh, home, our Ottawa Centre page on the CMOS uh, website. And I'll also throw out, if anybody uh, would like to volunteer a talk for our centre, um, please let us know. We're uh, uh, trying to broaden out the scope and uh, uh, involvement of people in different ways. Um, so Chris, I, I really want to thank you tremendously for uh, taking the time for uh, filling us in. And I'm going to ask people to turn on their microphone and give them a proper thank you <laughs> that we would do at a normal meeting. See if <laughs> so.